Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and Life Coach Cindy Chavez here. Today is Wednesday, October the 3rd, 2018, 8 a.m. Eastern Time, your first daily dose of happy for the day and your first dose of live happy that we've had in about a week because with a little help from the folks at Bitdefender Antivirus, we are now back doing a live broadcast in addition to recording this as a podcast. Yeah, (laughs) yay indeed. I was beginning to wonder if this thing was going to get resolved, and actually it isn't totally resolved yet. What they did was they figured out a workaround for me, and I had to follow these steps that they gave me, and I tried them this morning about a half hour ago, and they worked! They worked! So we're we're back live again. That's a great thing. So it always feels you, better when things start to work the way we feel they're supposed oh, to Oh, doesn't work. it? <laughs> oh, it was a relief. And it was a palpable relief. I mean, I really felt like, oh, thank God. <laughs> Not that we don't have most of our listeners listening to the recorded version, because we do, but we do have some people who are live listeners, and I, I don't want to take that away from them. In fact, I want to build that part up. So, yeah, I was so glad when I saw that their their little workaround worked. And that was my big news for the day. I don't even remember what happened yesterday. That was my big news to get the day started. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember what happened yesterday. Uh, I, I do that pretty often. <laughs> Wait a minute. What, what happened yesterday? Well, I, I think it's interesting, um, the whole idea of, that we've been talking about and I was, of, of revising what's been going on. Mm-hmm. And while you were talking about that, I was thinking we should have used this method. This is what happens, and maybe you did, but this is what happens with me is I learn a new method, and this isn't even new stuff for me, but I'll forget about a certain method or a certain tool. And then even though I'm teaching about it, and then something will will happen, and it'll be after the fact that I'm like, why didn't I use that? (laughs) Right. Well, that's kind of what we're doing with Neville Goddard. I mean, you you talked often about how much you like Goddard, and and you like what he has to say, and and even though uh, some of it is a little bit convoluted from the way we talk from a modern perspective once you learn to do the translations you found that there was a lot of value in there and that's why you wanted to share it around the program but when was the last time before this he actually looked at and read neville goddard oh me yeah oh i mean like in the past it never goes too long i mean i've got neville sitting right here in my office i I mean mr neville but neville's book (laughs) And, um, (laughs) and uh Actually, you know, sometimes I do a meditation and call in all of my, uh, my masterminders. Ah. And I, think was there. I, I was just thinking it was funny when you were saying his language is kind of convoluted. I mean, it really is w- when we, when we get into these stories that we're going to read this morning, they're, you know, you can tell in the language that it's not the way we generally speak to each other today. Right. Uh, because this was way back in the, Maybe 50s. I'm looking again because I have all the years for the book. So this particular one that we're reading right now is, is this Awakened Imagination? Right. Yeah. This one was in 1954. That was when it was published. Power of Awareness was 52. They go all the way back to 1942. So, you know, it's not like it's hundreds of years ago, but the language has shifted a lot it since has. then. And what I was thinking about was that I love Neville Goddard and I also have always loved my other favorite, Florence Scovelshin. Hmm. Um, same time period, right? Yeah, so right? <laughs> it's all this very old fashioned kind of <laughs> language and it's, it's kind of funny. Well, I was but, actually um, noticing it with a more modern, um, author as well. Cause I'm, uh, I'm, and I know you are too, but I'm a follower of Abraham Hicks. And I was realizing after a conversation with Patty Framo on Monday, and previous conversations with her, I haven't been using Ask and It Is Given in a long time. They've got those processes in the back of the book, right? 22 I know, processes. I, I pulled it out yesterday after we talked, and it's sitting on my desk because I have a project that I'm putting together right now, and I absolutely need to go look at those processes. So I was so glad you mentioned it. It was a great synchronicity. And you're right. There is The language there is kind of different as well, right? It is. It is. It's different. It's, it's a little bit more modern, but it still has its own unique... You need coloring, shall we say? <laughs> it's well, I always thought that things. was because Esther is sort of translating. Oh yeah. Into, right. I mean, she gets an impression of something and then puts it into words, and so sometimes the words. Actually, I think they even say sometimes they are new words or words that are used in a different way than we normally use them. Right. I can't think of one off the top of my head right now, but 
No, but there are examples of that because Esther's trying to take these blocks of thought that she's getting and translate them into something that we would understand today. And right. if, there, if there's no actual existing word for whatever the thought is, she's got to kind of create something just out of her own experience, which is not always easy to do. <laughs> so I give yeah. her credit for being so, able to do that. But uh, yeah, and, and, and with uh, Neville, I mean, because he's also using um, biblical terminology, that can confuse things even more because his use of the biblical terminology is different from the way a Christian preacher would use biblical terminology. So it just makes it even more fun trying to figure it out. <laughs> right. And I just picked up another book that's here. Um, Wallace Waddle's books. Oh, yeah. Right. They're also old. So it's really funny, all this language. So we're time traveling back to the 40s and 50s. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, well, I, I want to make sure before we get any further, we're trying to do early promos in the podcast. And I want to make sure we get oh, our promos right. in. So the first promo is if you are not yet a subscriber, chances are you are. But if you're not a subscriber, maybe this is one of your first episodes, please take a moment to click the, the subscribe button. I mean, if you're listening on a phone right now, Android or iPhone, you, you already figured out how to get to the podcast. All you need to do at this point is just click that subscribe button so you get all the episodes coming to your phone every single day. Um, if you have uh, perhaps a little bit of technophobia, not really sure how to do things, we've got all the instructions on how to do it right on the homepage of our website at loatoday.net. So there's an alternative way to get that information. But please do become a subscriber because, man, oh, man, it really does pay off. Our, our loyal subscribers tell us repeatedly how much they love the podcast. They really look forward to it. It helps give them a lift in their life. And that's our goal. That's why we call it the Daily Dose of Happy. We want people to feel better because they listen to each of the different podcasts podcast with all of our co-hosts with their different perspectives and different understandings and so forth. And they all kind of come merged together into this really neat pie, so to speak, that uh, has all the flavors in it. Um, and, and it gives you that lift every single day. So please become a subscriber. And then for those who are currently subscribers, or maybe you're just becoming one today, please post on your favorite social media channels about LOAToday.net. Say whatever you want. Uh, hopefully something nice, but say whatever you want. And when you do that, you actively use the law of attraction as a deliberate creator to reach out and help other people who you don't even know to find us because it goes way beyond people you know. It goes to people that you don't know about. And when you're every person that you're helping to find the uh, LOA Today Daily Dose of Happy podcast is one more person who's finding a way to get happier in their lives. Can you imagine what happens when the entire world learns to be happy in their lives every single day? That's our goal. So please help us attain that goal. And it is working. People have been helping us do that for the last three months. Three months ago, we were averaging about 85 listeners per podcast. Now we're averaging 210 and growing. So it really is helping helping since we've been doing this and we want to keep doing it. So please subscribe. Uh, please subscribe. Yes, do subscribe, but also put out there that you're listening to LOAToday.net on your favorite social media channel, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, in, you know, Instagram, Reddit, whatever you're using, because it really helps everybody. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And, you know, I love that you said, <laughs> I hope you say something nice. But I'm thinking, you know, just even saying, I've been listening to LOA today. Yeah. Dot net is, yeah. that's, you know, I love that. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about it the other day when you were, when we were telling, you know, this, the promos, when we were giving the promos out and you were asking people if they would post on social media. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about how many times I've seen someone post something like, I just read this article or I've been checking out this blog or right. whatever and a link and I've gone and looked at it and yeah. they haven't even said, this is a fantastic thing. No. They've just said, this is what I'm doing. And that That's piqued right. my curiosity. I'm like, oh, I want to go see. If somebody else so, is doing it, it must be good, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? Power of suggestion. <laughs> exactly. You know? Seriously. Uh. So that's good. And then also, um, since today we're we're getting back on on the track where we're doing the show live, uh, we would love to have you call in sometime oh, if you're yes. listening live. And you can do that as well at LOAToday.net. Uh, there's all the instructions there, but we would love to have you join us for a comment or a question or some coaching or whatever it is that we can help you with or just to say hello. And by the way, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, actually, because cool. not only do we have phone numbers for many places around the world, but even if you're in a location where there's no uh, internationally available phone number for you, you can contact us by getting onto the Zoom platform. It's a free download. 
And then you click the little link that's on the home page, like uh, Cindy was saying, and boom, you're connected. You're actually listening to us directly through the platform we use to talk to each other. So, I mean, it's, it's like you don't have any excuses left. You want to talk to us? You want to uh, interact with us? <laughs> hey, there are lots of ways to do it, and they all work great. And that would be really great to have more people calling in and saying hello and oh, getting yeah. involved in the conversation. You know, that's that's always a boost for the energy. Well, it is. And all the different perspectives that people bring in, because everybody has a different perspective on life, right? And how, yeah. on the law of attraction and on how all this stuff works. And those perspectives, man, that, that's why the, the podcast itself is so successful. Because I've got you six co-hosts who are all life coaches, plus Anne-Marie, plus Louie, and my own perspective. That's nine different perspectives. And boy, oh boy, <laughs> the conversations go off in really interesting directions. So yeah, perspective is everything. That's why it's so great to have that new perspective when someone calls in. So we have been working our way through um, some of Neville Goddard's writings, and they are very interesting. Mm -hmm. And today, yesterday we were talking about the pruning shears of revision. So we were talking about going back and reimagining an event. I mean, that's the best way I can say it. Mm -hmm. um, whenever we've had something happen in our life, and usually something that we wish were a little different. And so one of the things that Neville has done in not just this particular book that we're looking at, but a couple of others is he will tell stories of how, well, actually, I think these were letters that he received. And also he did a lot of lecturing. So people that would come up to him that would follow his lectures. It's kind of funny, right? Because there were no podcasts back in the 40s. <laughs> right. <laughs> So these people would go hear him speak. And I think he spoke every week in certain places and people would follow him. They would go listen and listen to his lectures. And then they would come back and tell him these stories of how they had used what he was teaching. And so what he was teaching was at the end of the day that we would reimagine our day, reimagine a particular event that had happened so that it happened differently and that how that would change our current experience and even the outcome in the future that was connected to this. It was amazing that last night, um, and I, I I have to go back and find it. I can't remember the person's name, but someone shared something on social media and it was from a new teacher that I had never heard of, but it was just a little small kind of video blip. And I didn't even turn the sound on. It had the words on the screen. So I was just watching it, but it was talking about the science of our memory and how the way we remember things affects not only how we feel right now, but what actually happens in the future. And it get, it got very scientific, but I was like, this is exactly what Neville is saying. Mm. Just not, not in such a, quantum physics scientific kind of way right right right. yeah but pretty cool though <laughs> it, it was really cool i was like okay i've got to figure out where this is so that i can you know bring it up and read it because it i think if i can transcribe it it'll just be a paragraph but it was really cool how it wove all these different scientific concepts in yeah. uh, to exactly what we're talking about because we know that time is not linear so even though we see a past and a present and a future, science says everything's happening at once. I know it's a lot to try it's, to. That's one of those thoughts that kind of boggles your mind when you first hear it. Yep. Everything it really happens does. at once. It's like, oh, what happened? <laughs> right. And so, and so it makes sense if that is the case that when we reimagine something, we're actually changing whatever happened. Mm. So I thought it would be fun to read this next story of how one of Neville's friends used this method. Okay. Yeah, let's do so it. Neville, so Neville says, here is the way an artist friend forgave herself. Okay. Remember we, he, we get into a lot of these Christian biblical type of concepts because he uses a lot of scripture and the way he defines forgiveness is basically just changing the situation because the original language translates 
what really means missing the mark. Like picture yourself shooting an arrow at a target and you want to hit the bullseye, but you've missed the mark. That's translated to the word sin. And forgiveness is of sin is when we just pull the arrow out of the target, put it back in the bow, shoot it into the middle of the target where we wanted it in the first place. Yeah, it's re-aiming and shooting again is what it is. That's what just, forgiving is. Yes. And so he says, this is the way an artist friend forgave herself and was set free from pain, annoyance, and unfriendliness. Knowing that nothing but forgetfulness and forgiveness will bring us to new values, she cast herself upon her imagination and escaped from the prison of her senses. She writes, okay, so this one was a letter. She says, Thursday, I taught all day in the art school. Only one small thing marred the day. Coming into my afternoon classroom, I discovered the janitor had left all the chairs on top of the desks after cleaning the floor. As I lifted a chair down, it slipped from my grasp and struck me a sharp blow on the instep of my right foot. I immediately examined my thoughts and found that I had criticized the man for not doing his job properly. Since he had lost his helper, I realized he probably felt that he had done more than enough, and it was an unwanted gift that had bounced and hit me on the foot. Looking down at my foot, I saw both my skin and nylons were intact, (laughs) so I forgot the whole thing. Now, this is interesting to me. I want to comment on this because remember when we were back reading Abraham Hicks, how we had a whole chapter or maybe more uh, on complaining. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was talking about how when we complained about one thing, it often showed up. They were talking about how it would show up in our body as an illness or disease or discomfort. Mm -hmm. And this woman is saying that she realized in her mind she had been criticizing this man for not doing his job properly. And then she dropped the chair on her foot. Yeah. Definite connection going there. Yeah. She says that night. Okay. So she's dropped the chair on her foot. She's looked down. Her skin and her nylons are both intact. She says, so she just (laughs) forgot about it that night after I'd been working intensely for about three hours on a drawing, I decided to make myself a cup of coffee to my utter amazement. I couldn't manage my right foot at all, and it was giving out great bumps of pain. I hopped over to a chair and took off my slipper to look at it. The entire foot was a strange purplish pink, swollen out of shape and red hot. I tried walking on it and found that it just flapped. I had no control over it whatsoever. It looked like one of two things. Either I had cracked a bone when I dropped the chair on it, or something could be dislocated. No use speculating what it is. Better get rid of it right away. She puts that in quotation marks, too. Right? I guess that was what what she was thinking. Yeah, that was she was quoting what Neville said. I'm not sure which. Hmm. That's a good point. And it could have been something she heard in a lecture as well, right? Yeah. She says, so I became quiet, all ready to melt myself into light. Now, remember in the past readings when he was talking about what what I really just term as meditation, but he was talking about getting very, very relaxed Mm -hmm. until like melting into light. I think that's what she's saying here. So she says, I became quiet, all ready to melt myself into light. To my complete bewilderment, my imagination refused to cooperate. It just said no. This sort of thing often happens when I'm painting. I just started to argue. Why not? (laughs) It just kept saying no. Finally, I gave up and said, you know, I'm in pain. I'm trying hard not to be frightened, but you are the boss. What do you want to do? The answer, go to bed and review the day's events. I said, all right, but let me tell you, if my foot isn't perfect by tomorrow morning, you have only yourself to blame. (laughs) She has a very persistent inner being. I got to say, I mean, this inner being gives (laughs) orders like you go to bed now. (laughs) And I love how she says, all right, but let me tell you. It's all your fault. (laughs) After arranging the bedclothes so they didn't touch my foot, I started to review the day. It was slow going as I had difficulty keeping my attention away from my foot. I went through the whole day, saw nothing to add to the chair incident. But when I reached the early evening, 
I found myself coming face to face with a man who for the past year has made a point of not speaking. Wow. The first time this happened, I thought he had grown deaf. I'd known him since school days, but we had never done more than say hello and comment on the weather. Mutual friends assured me I'd done nothing, that he had said he that he had said he never liked me and finally decided it was not worthwhile speaking. I had said, hi. He hadn't answered. I found that I thought, poor guy, what a horrid state to be in. I shall do something about this ridiculous state of affairs. So in my imagination, I stopped right there and I redid the scene. I said, hi. And he answered, hi, and smiled. And I now thought, good old Ed. I ran the scene over a couple of times and went on to the next incident and finished up the day. Now what? Do we do my foot or the concert? I had been melting and wrapping up a wonderful present of courage and success for a friend who was to make her debut the following day, and I had been looking forward to giving it to her tonight. My imagination sounded a little bit solemn as it said, let us do the concert. It will be more fun. But first, couldn't we just take my perfectly good imagination foot out of this physical one before we start? start, I pleaded. By all means. That done, I had a lovely time at the concert and my friend got a tremendous ovation. So I'm, 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 every time I read this, I think, okay, so this was all imaginary. Is that the way you read it? Well, it also sounds like she had an actual concert to go to. I mean, the concert kind of sprouts up out of nowhere the way she tells the story, but it sounds like she had an actual concert that was being put on by her friend, and she went to support her friend and had a good time. Well, that's what I thought, too, except for that her foot was in such bad shape. I really think that maybe she just imagined it. Because how could she have gotten around? Yeah, you make a good point. Yeah, because and because she asked her inner being, now what, do we do my foot or the concert? So I think, well, maybe she actually already went to the concert. It's possible. And that was part of her day in the memory. And she really wants to get to her foot, you notice? And <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and by the way, I, I want to make also note of the fact that she is communicating very well with her inner being, and there's been no talk of an inner being at all. Right. You know? It's just, it's just she calls it her imagination. Right. <laughs> so she says, by now, I was very, very sleepy, and I fell asleep doing my project. The next morning, as I was putting on... Now, now, see, she says fell asleep doing her project. Yeah. So, I mean, this is all imagination. She is, she is using her imagination to go back and remember her entire day and fell asleep remembering do, working on her project. The next morning, as I was putting on my slipper, I suddenly had a quick memory picture of withdrawing a discolored and swollen foot from the same slipper. I took my foot out and looked at it. It was perfectly normal in every respect. Wow. There was a tiny pink spot on the instep where I remembered I had hit it with a chair. What a vivid dream that was, I thought, and dressed. While waiting for my coffee, I wandered over to my drafting table and saw that all of my brushes were lying helter-skelter and unwashed. Whatever possessed you to leave your brushes like that? Don't you remember? It was because of your foot. So I hadn't been dreaming, after all, but a beautiful healing. She had won. By the art of revision, what she had never have won by force. In heaven, the only art of living is forgetting and forgiving. Especially, and, and this is a quote from Blake, especially to the female. I don't know why he said that. Well, I think uh, I can tell you why. Okay, tell me why. I think Blake was indirectly alluding to the fact that women, especially in earlier ages, were much more attuned and in tune with what they were feeling. Men had long been trained not to feel anything. Oh, that's a good point. You know? And there's also the intuitive thing. Right. That often gets attributed to women. Women's Women's intuition. intuition. Right, right. Um, I have some men in my life that are as intuitive as anyone I know. So, but I, I get that. So I believe that must be it. Um, So Neville says, we should take our life, not as it appears to be, but from the vision of this artist, from the vision of the world made perfect that is buried under all minds, buried and waiting for us to revise the day. We are led to believe a lie when we see with, not through, 
the eye. <laughs> another Blake quote. That's another Blake quote. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a good one because we talk about this a lot is that we have to get past the, the senses because in order to consciously create something with our imagination, we're often imagining something that's completely contrary to what our senses are saying. Yeah, it's another way of saying I am not going to be a pure realist. I'm willing to try to look beyond what is, quote, the real world, unquote, and imagine the way I want the world to be. And that's not realism. <laughs> and, you know, I, re I feel like I remember this story um, from maybe another book or a lecture. And I, in my memory, I thought that it went further and that and that when she saw this person again, he actually did say hello to her. Really? And and I was expecting that to be in this writing of it, and I didn't see it. Um, but I wanted to, this was, I was thinking of another story where someone was using this revision, and I looked for it, and I found it. What I thought was so interesting was that it's in another book of Neville's, mm -hmm. and in that other book where this story is, it talks about, the pruning shears of revision. And I was ah. like, okay, so he uses, cause that's the name of this particular chapter that we just, we were just reading from. Right. So I wanted to share this other story. Okay. Um, because I, this is one of my favorites and it also uses this tool of going back and revising something, but this was not revising the day. Uh, this is really interesting. Wait, now where's this from? This is from the law and the promise and it's in the third chapter. The Law and the Promise by Neville Goddard. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, this person, I don't know if they wrote to him or spoke to him, but they said, oh, it looks like it was a letter. They said, for 39 years, <laughs> wow. I, had I had suffered from a weak back. Ooh. The pain would increase and decrease, but would never leave completely. The condition had progressed to the point where I used medical treatment almost constantly. The doctor would put the right hip, would put the hip right for the moment, but the pain simply would not go away. One night I heard you speak of revision and wondered to myself if a condition of almost 40 years could be revised. I had remembered that at the age of three or four years, I had fallen backward from a very high swing and had been quite ill at that time because of a serious hip injury. Uh -huh. From that time on, I'd never been completely free from pain and had paid many a dollar to alleviate the condition to no avail. This year, during the month of August, the pain had become more intense. And one night I decided to test myself and attempt to revise that ancient accident which had been the cause of so much distress and pain and costly medical fees most of my adult life. Many nights passed before I could feel myself back to the age of childhood play. So I want to point out there that <laughs> yeah. he persevered, right? It's like, oh, it wasn't this. Yeah, I tried last night. I couldn't really do it. No, he says many, many nights, nights passed. passed. I don't know how many. Yeah, but that, that's a significant point because we do easily give up. And he didn't give up. And, and right. when, you're, when you're going through something like that, it feels like forever just the one session, you know, doing it over and over and over again and not getting to where you want to get to and persisting. That is a lot of focus. That's really determined focus. I mean, even the woman in the story, the artist, right? Remember, it's like even in her just revising her day, she keeps saying, can't we just talk about the foot now? <laughs> right. Yes, <laughs> <It's> exactly. Like... <laughs> You think of all the mundane things we do in a day and she's re cause she was actually revising the entire day. So she did. Okay. But, so this person with the terrible pain says many nights passed before I could feel myself back to the age of childhood play, but I succeeded one night. I actually felt myself on that swing, feeling the rush of wind as the swing rose higher and higher as the swing slowed down. I jumped forward, landing solidly and easily on my feet. In the imaginal action, I ran to my mother and insisted that she come watch what I could do. I did it again, jumping down from the swing and landing safely on my two feet. I repeated this imaginal act over and over 
until I fell asleep in the doing of it. Within two days, the pain in my back and hip began to recede, and within two months, pain no longer existed for me. Nice. A, a condition that had plagued me for more than 39 years and had cost a small fortune in attempted cure was no more. Wow. Very nice. Really, really and I, when I found this story, I was like, yes, that's the one I was remembering. The next sentence says, it is to the pruning shears of revision that we <laughs> owe our prime fruit. And I was like, that's so funny because that was the chapter we'd been reading. Well, it's obviously, Isn't that amazing? It's a major concept in his thinking. That's pretty clear because, I mean, Abraham kind of does the same thing. If they have major concepts, they bring them up all over the place. And it's, you know, they'll, they'll bring it up in three or four books and in 25 workshops and everything else because they want to keep hammering in. This is important, folks. Pay attention to this. I think he's right, doing the same thing right. there. Right. So, I mean, these stories are so really great. And I, I know we've jumped from one book to the other, but I'd like to read a little bit further on what yeah, sure. Neville says after the story. Okay. Um, so this is from the law and the promise. Uh, he says, man and his past are one continuous structure. Now, that's just really interesting in the light of knowing that time isn't li linear. Mm -hmm. Because the way I always view it, and I still think this is also true, right? It's like the past is, it's just a memory at this point. That really is all it is. Well, I'll tell you, my sister once described to me, um, she, she used to be a member of a spiritual church. Spiritual meaning um, psychic type spirituality. Uh, okay. In Washington, D.C. I think it was called the, the Church of Two Worlds. I think it's still there. Um, my sister doesn't live in D.C. anymore. But she would often regale us with tales about what happened at the various classes and, and sessions and so forth that she attended there. And one thing that she told me about one time was how one of the psychics had explained to her what a lifetime looks like from the perspective of a non-physical being. And just as you were saying, everything happens all in the same instant. That's what the non-physical being sees. Uh, and, and of course, they don't necessarily see the way we do. It's not like a vision seeing, but it's the best way I can describe it. So I'll just call it seeing. But what they see, so to speak, is a worm of us. The worm being all of the actions that we take in life at kind of like uh, a, a virtual reality, like a computer-generated thing, where all of the previous frames are left in place. And so you can see the progression oh. of the creature, like there's this worm behind them, showing all the different previous actions, twisting and turning and so forth. That's the kind of worm that she was talking about. So in one instant, you can look at the entire lifetime of all of the stuff that, that person was involved in doing just by looking at that worm of activity. Wow. Amazing. Yeah, that's quite a description, isn't it? Yeah. So man and his past are one continuous structure. There it is. The structure contains all of the past, which has been conserved and still operates below the threshold of his senses to influence the present and the future. This is actually exactly what that little thing I saw last night was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so... It's it's so mind blowing to me. The if the past and me, <laughs> if my past and I are one continuous structure, and that structure contains all of my past, and it's still operating below the threshold of my senses, influencing my present and my future, then the ability to go back and change that past has got to be powerful. It's got to be huge. We're only doing it by imagining a different memory. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. So what we're suggesting here is that worm is not permanent. <laughs> that worm can be modified to a, a different worm. <laughs> well, worm, something, worm is such a weird thing. That, but <laughs> I think I said this uh, in a podcast before about something else, but now it's making me realize that I need to do that. I, I keep, I do keep journals and, but I, what I haven't kept journals of often is these, these methods of Neville's, these revision mm. methods. And so often they are concerning things that aren't a huge deal, 
right? Like this episode right here, this guy has been in pain for 39 years and mm-hmm. he remembers when he was three or four flying off a swing, you know, and so he goes back and he reimagines sticking the landing, right? Right. <laughs> and thereby healing himself. Yeah. And he, and he does it over and over and, and in his imagination, he calls his mom, come see. <laughs> he does it again and he does it again until he falls asleep, you know, really sticking that landing and not falling off on his hip. Right. Okay. And then he says, in a couple of days, the pain was lessened, but in two months, the pain was gone. Right. Now, and that's a really big thing because this thing affected him for pretty much his whole life. Yeah. I've used this method so many times and not really kept track, but I know it's been effective and I'm encouraging myself now to, to keep better notes because have... all of my successes have not been like this, like mm-hmm. something that plagued me for 39 years is, right, right. is cured, right? But they've been smaller things that I think start to go unnoticed over time. And then we don't really remember them. And when we can keep a note of them and bring it to our memory, it helps us to do it again and again and again. Mm -hmm. Because we start having a stronger faith in our ability to do this. I, I agree with you completely. In fact, I would note that it's extremely rare to have something where we get that instant feedback multiple times in a row where it really starts to make impression because we haven't forgotten what it was that we were originally thinking about or or either deliberately or undeliberately attracting. But when you get something like that, it's great. It's great because, you know, you can see the immediate connection. It's just that that's not the way it normally works out. I mean, yesterday, for instance, um, just before the podcast, we have a – Louise and I have a new neighbor upstairs from us that just moved in yesterday or the day before, I guess. And about 15 minutes before the podcast, the neighbor upstairs in the room directly above me started playing some really loud music with the window open, which I could hear. And if I put my, my, uh, my equipment up, you know, my, my screens up, it was actually registering on the microphone. I'm saying, Oh no, how am I going to do a podcast like this? Right. Right. And I had just been reading about the, uh, Abraham Hicks process about, uh, just leaving it to the universal manager. So I said, okay, well, I'm not sure what to do about this. I certainly don't want to start a fight with a new neighbor. So I'm just going to say universal manager, fix it. I don't want any more music. I it can't be interfering with my podcast. I need to have a podcast that is just, you know, has a quiet background so that everything works beautifully. And I just kind of gave up because I didn't know what else to do. Well, 15 minutes later, the music turned off. <laughs> just in time to start the podcast. So I announced on the podcast how the music had turned off. I told that little story. And you know, as I was telling that little story about how the music was so annoying and it was, it was going to come over the microphone, guess what happened? The, the music, music started to play on? again. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and so I noted that the music had come on again because I had That's just like attracted it. Chair on your foot. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and I, I said on the podcast that, well, what, here's what happened, Wendy. I mean, we were just talking about it. And now he turns the music back on. So now I got to get back into the frame of mind of, I really want the universal manager to turn the music off. You know, 10 minutes later, the music went off again. Oh my goodness. I that's mean, we, hilarious. but that's so rare. That's my point. It, it was a great story showing how the law of attraction can be very responsive, but that's not the way we normally experience it. So to your point, most often there are like large gaps of time. We forget that we even thought about something, then we get the result that we don't make the connection to it. So I think your point is brilliant. You, it's a good idea to be writing this stuff down because that way we can see more of the connections. And like you said, the more of those connections we see, the more we believe. And so, you know, I have to look at, at when I look at my life and I look at the relationships I have with other people, um, I don't have, I mean, I can't really think of any relationships that are uncomfortable as a general rule. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe that's because I've, you know, I work on that. Uh, but when I have had a conversation or, you know, something with someone that has been uncomfortable, I've used this method, right? Like falling asleep that night. I mean, I, I think this is a situation most people could relate to. You have a conversation, um, and, <clears throat> it's not real comfortable and, you know, you can't stop thinking about it and you go to sleep that night thinking about it. I would, I would undo it or redo it. I would have the conversation in a different way. I would have myself reimagining the conversation. I would have myself say something different than what I said. 
something maybe that was more kind, something maybe that would facilitate a better response. I would also imagine the other party saying something different to me and have the conversation end where everything is great and we both are very loving, kind, and happy that we connected and had this conversation and worked everything out. And when I think about it now, I'm like, well, maybe that is why so many of my relationships are so smooth, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't generally write those things down. Right. So I can't tell you, you know, last summer I had a little argument with someone and then that night I went to bed and I reimagined it and then they called me the next day and everything was fine. You know, I I, I can't tell you a story like that because I haven't recorded recorded it. it. I know I do it. Yeah. And I and imagine all the stories you would have to tell, not just here on the podcast, but on your own blog and, in, and when you're talking with your clients and so forth, because you actually had the story. You could actually tell them the sequence of events and here's what I was thinking. Here's what it, what it led to. And here's how I, how I revised it. And here's what that produced, because you have it all figured out that that's what happened rather than, well, geez, I can't remember thing, any it, of it. Right. It stretches over time, right? And exactly. so when we're revising things, like I have some things I'm, I won't speak about yet because I have a tendency to be better with speaking about things. Once they're kind of in the rear view mirror. I hear you. Yeah. Right. But I have some things that I'm working on creating right now and I'm using these methods. But maybe it's this. It's that most of the time when I'm using Neville's methods, a lot of it is as I'm falling asleep. Mm. Maybe that's why I don't write them down as much as I write down other, you know. <laughs> well, it's funny you should workings, say that because right? I do the same thing. I, I have done some of my best work falling asleep. And the problem is I'm not there to transcribe it. I'm asleep. <laughs> right. So I have to start thinking about that a little more and maybe writing it down as an intention. Like this is the work that I'm doing now. This is what I'm revising in the memory kind of thing. Because um, you can use this in all sorts of ways. I would recommend that you give your your mind and your imagination permission to remember it when you wake up the next morning so that you don't have to write it down before you fall asleep and create a new condition for yourself. Like, I have to write it down before I can go to sleep. (laughs) (laughs) Well, just as a general rule, like I do keep journals with intentions and things. So what I meant by that is not to do it every night before I fall asleep, but that I may be working on a project for a length of time. And in imagining the same thing every night over and over, like we have seen in some of these stories that they were, it worked pretty quickly, but we also see like this person that was on the swing, it took them quite a while be, before they could imagine themselves back into that feeling place of being on the swing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It said many it, days passed, right? Something like that. It can like take that. a lot so, of practice, yeah, especially if you're – because um, he was dealing with pain, a, a chronic oh, pain that he'd been dealing with all right. of his life. But nevertheless, it was always right there on his mind. So trying to change the story in the midst of that, that's not an easy thing to do. That takes a lot of focus. I discovered that yeah, this does, past May when I was trying to deal with the, that ligament issue and, and right. trying desperately to focus on what it felt like to have – a, a knee that felt good and, and it's not hard, not easy to do when you got that pain going on right there it's like your pain is saying no 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 the knee hurts and i'm saying yes 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 the the, the knee doesn't hurt no 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 yes 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 <laughs> well i'm picturing like these two stories that we told today that you know i'm picturing this guy it's like he's been in pain for 39 years yeah. and i guarantee the day he was on the swing before he fell he wasn't in any pain That's right, right. <laughs> exactly. four years old swinging high on the swing yeah. just enjoying life absolutely and so Trying to imagine that when you're, you know, when your hip is throbbing is, is difficult. So, but he goes on, I want to finish up this one little place and then we'll move back over to the other book. But so man and his past are one continuous structure. This structure contains all of the past, which has been conserved and still operates below the threshold of his senses to influence the present and the future of his life. The whole with a W H O L E, the mm-hmm. whole, the whole is carrying all of its contents with it. Mm. Any alteration of content will result in an alteration in the present and the future. <laughs> mm-hmm. The first act of correction or cure is always revise. If the past can be, can be recreated into the present, so can the revised past. And thus the revised past appears within the very heart 
of her present life. Not fate, but a revised past brought her good fortune. Mm -hmm. Make results and accomplishment the crucial test of true imagination and your confidence in the power of imagination to create reality will grow gradually from your experiments with revision confronted by experience. Only by this process of experiment can you realize the potential power of your awakened and controlled imagination. So in other words, don't give up, keep trying, keep working on it until you get it. Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. Definitely keep going. Um, and it does, I noticed that when I first started doing this, somewhere, somewhere else I learned from Neville about, um, revising the day every day, just the whole day, right? Right. So you really start to, to remember or start to recognize the, the, um, power of your memory or the lack of power of your memory. You know how you were just saying, wait, what did I do yesterday? Right. Kind of like that. Like it's, I noticed I would be in bed at night and I would try to go backwards in my day or forwards from the morning or from the evening, but just cover the whole day. Like, what did I do today? So going backwards is the easiest way at the beginning, right? I would get in bed and I would think, okay, so I just got in bed and right before that, I got ready for bed and right before that I was doing some reading and before that I was, and I would go all the way backwards just as a way to train my mind to really be focused. Yeah, it's a good approach. That works. Right. Yeah. Or I would start forward. But what I would, what I noticed in the beginning is often I would fall asleep before I got the whole day <laughs> revised. So now, um, even though Neville says revise the day, I often revise anything that I wish were different. Mm. And right now, I don't have a lot of things in a day that, oh, I sure wish this were different. But I have some big projects and things I want to create. Uh, so I've been imagining those okay. as if they already were here, yeah. right? Assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled. Wish fulfilled We've talked right. about that a little bit, you bringing yeah. all the senses into it and using it that way. That's very good. I just think these are tools that every person practicing conscious creation using the law of attraction needs to tap into. <laughs> I agree. Especially especially with this idea that man and his past are one continuous structure. The structure contains all of the past. And when we change the memory of the past, we also change the present and the future. How with, can we not want to do that? With the key concept <laughs> being that we can change it. The structure is not permanently fixed. The structure mm. is malleable. The structure can be changed, even though it's in the past. That's a significant thing. And it's one that I think we easily overlook, too, because, you know, we tend to think, well, realistically, I, that's what happened in the past, right? I, the past is the past. And that what we usually say. But right. apparently the past is what we imagine it's going to be, because when we imagine it and imagine it fully and play it out in our mind, we actively change it. In our right. experience, so that it, it, our our lives experience a new past, basically. He uses, you know, often Neville will use not just scripture, but you see we've been quoting Blake and I'm trying to think of who else. I know he quotes a lot of different writers, philosophers, poets, but he has this one quote. <clears throat> it's from, uh, it's Sir John Calling Squire from The Birds. But the quote is, let your strong imagination turn the great wheel backward until Troy unburns. Mm, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. So these are not new thoughts. No, not at all. <laughs> They've been around no, for a while, it, apparently. <laughs> it gets thrown into that category of new thought. But these are not new thoughts. And so I think it's some of my favorite stuff. When when uh, when we started this chapter today. yesterday, we were now of course we started today with the second half of chapter four of the book Awakened Imagination and the Search by Neville Goddard. When we started chapter four yesterday, we titled it The Pruning Shears of Revision, which is what he titles it. And I commented right. that is a really strange phrase. I had no idea what it meant. Now that we've gone through all this, I think maybe we're at a point where we can define what are the pruning shears of revision. And when we look at that phrase, pruning shears, well, what are pruning shears? I, even I, a non-gardener, know what that is, probably because my wife runs a gardening business, so I have an idea what pruning is. <laughs> <laughs> well, pruning is where you take away the parts of the plant that are 
dead or, or, you know, have passed for the year or whatever so that you can get new buds and, and new growth going on. So pruning is about creating new growth. And the shears of oh, revision, wow. the shears of revision are about using revision, using the ability of the human being to imagine a different path, to revision that past is a way of shearing away the dead wood and allowing new growth to take its place. That's what the pruning shears of revision are. Now the phrase makes some sense to me. Wow, really? Seriously? I love the idea that, you know, every time I read it, I kept thinking of synaptic pruning, which I think is a, is applicable as well. It definitely um, is. Yeah. Right? And But the idea that when we prune a plant, we often are taking away the parts of the plant that are not, they're not healthy. Right. We're pruning off, like you said, the dead wood. We're pruning off the parts that aren't necessary and the parts we don't want. And that's exactly what happens here. Mm -hmm. Going back and saying, Oh, this was, this was great, but not this little part. I'm right. going to redo that one. <laughs> yes. I'm going to shake so, my shrub. <laughs> for anyone that, you know, which is everyone, right? That wishes they could have a do over around something. I just think it's just great. Right. To, to recognize we can. So any golfer knows the term mulligan. The pruning shears of revision is a mulligan. <laughs> That's it. It's a do-over. <laughs> and the thing I want to point out, too, because we haven't talked about it too much today. Uh, maybe we did yesterday and when we started with Neville. But if I had to shrink down, you know, everything I know that's important about what Neville teaches into just a few phrases... Uh, of course, the pruning shears and revision would be would be part of that very important piece. But the other part is his idea of assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And key word there being feeling. And if you noticed when this man was, I think it was a man when for some reason, but when this person was imagining themselves as a child on the swing, they were feeling the wind in blow past them when they were swinging. Right. And so when we can bring all our senses into it, it will get us into that feeling place even quicker. He also imagined landing on both of his two feet. And if you've ever been on a swing and jumped off and landed on your feet, there's a specific way that feels, right? Right. So he was imagining actual feeling. So assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled. I think it's important to remember that we're not imagining it like we're watching a movie, but we are actually in our body in the imagination. Like he wasn't looking at himself on a swing and seeing himself jump off and land. Mm -hmm. He was imagining himself on the swing. He was in his body. He was imagining what it felt like to have the wind rushing by him and jumping off and what it felt like to have his feet hitting the ground. That's a really important part of this process is to inhabit your body and imagine the feelings that you're having. Mm. Right. Yeah, because so, when, you're, when you're in that imagining place where you're imagining the feelings, the feelings make it more real, don't they? Or they make it seem more real. And not just the feelings uh, like emotional feelings, but all of the senses and the awareness of what's going on ar around you. Like if you remember the story of the blind girl that did not have transportation. Right. And, and wanted a driver, someone to drive her to her job. She imagined herself in the car and she imagined hearing the rumbling of the engine and feeling the rumbling of the vibration of the car. She imagined also, but she also imagined the city around her and the noises of the city and the sights and everything. So she, she was using all of her, which was funny because she was blind. Yeah. But she was imagining what the way she experienced the senses of knowing the big bustling city was around her and she was in a car. So really tapping in, I like to tap into all five senses at first. That always helps me start to really inhabit the imagination that way where I'm experiencing it so that I can assume. So it's not just saying, okay, assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled. What is it you're wishing for? And you say, well, 
I wish I had, you know, um, I don't know, more money in the bank. There has to be things that you can tap into that you actually feel. Right. Because what right? does money so in the like, bank well, feel like? It doesn't feel like anything. It's just money in the exactly. bank. Exactly. So, so what often I encourage clients sometimes to get into that relaxed state and to not to let, to kind of let the vision come to you, not chase it too much, but just let your imagination do the work. In the same way that, you know, when we go to sleep and have a dream, we, the dream comes to us usually. Mm-hmm. And so imagine what it would be like. So you can ask yourself some further questions to get into that place, especially if the thing that you're saying you're wishing for is kind of like that. Like I, that's why I used money in the bank because so many times people, Oh, I need more money in the bank. Well, what does that feel like? (laughs) Right. It's easier to say, well, what would that, what would that do for you? What would be different? Right. Because it's usually, it's not the money that we're usually after. It's that we think that it's, going to allow us to have something else right it's going to affect our lifestyle our lifestyle is going to improve in some way or some ways or maybe a lot of different ways just by because we got the money available so that that's what you're right that's what it really feels like is all that stuff all that all those things all those activities those events those friendships you know the health the wealth all that kind of stuff all of that is part of an experience that we're trying to to create into our, in our imaginations or, or as you say i think you're saying it very nicely allow our imaginations to create for us. Yes. Let the process be easy. Um, And, and it's not, you know, sometimes that doesn't mean it won't take some perseverance. Mm -hmm. I think of this guy who said, you know, many days passed or many nights passed, you know, before I could get into that place. Um, So if you're in physical pain, definitely it, that may make it a little more challenging. Um, But I I like to remember my senses of touch, of sight, of hearing, of smelling, of tasting, because I can go th- I can go through that list. <laughs> yeah. And, and imagine what I might like. I I told the story last week of one of the things that I'm working on is an art uh, an art studio, and so in my imagination, some of it's easy. I can feel I can walk into my studio and imagine myself touching my brushes, my paint brushes. Mm. And I, in my imagination, I brought a friend with me so I could show her my studio. And so I was talking to her so I could hear her saying things to me. Right. So I've got the hearing and the touching. And then I was like, taste, what do you taste in an art studio? Well, I guess we're going to have to have just come from coffee and have a coffee with us. Uh (laughs) So use all the, get all the senses involved because that way your imagination can use all of those. And I appreciate that about the blind girl story because the sense she discussed most in that story was auditory, which is my best sense. And so mm-hmm. for me, it was a good reminder. You got this great sense there. Your sense of vision may not be as strong as your sense of sound and of hearing. Use the sense of hearing. You know, lean on that one more. It's a good reminder. Right. We all do have dominant senses, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that's a good point. And then there's the emotional feelings as well Mm -hmm. feeling joyful feeling happy feeling relieved is another one uh relief tells a big story (laughs) uh when when i feel relief i can think of certain situations where i've experienced feeling relief and it's a wonderful thing to feel and it tells us that sometimes that okay this is this is it. We're kind of imagining in the right direction here. Oh, what a relief. So that's another one. <laughs> it is, yeah. Well, it's a good uh, point to draw to a close on, too, because one of the things we're always aiming for is relief. Well, we just achieved relief, so let, let's leave off on relief. However, there is one other thing I need you to do before we part company for the morning, before our afternoon podcast, and that is to remind people who are perhaps interested in a little coaching to get to that to some of these places, maybe do some of that uh, dreaming and so forth, maybe uh, you know figure out how to get unstuck because they're dealing with the chronic pain. How do they reach out to you for that kind of help, Cindy? They can find me um, on my website. There's a contact form. Uh, at cindychavez.com, C-I-N-D-I-E-C-H-A-V-E-Z, cindychavez.com. You can reach out to me there. I'd be happy to hear from you. All right. Well, we'll continue the conversation this afternoon. I'm looking forward to it. Me too. And we hope that you'll join us as well next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. 
Bye, everyone.